Welcome to our virtual audience this evening. I'm Amy McDonald, Director of City Space. Tonight is the second in our series, Phenomenal Women, looking at women who have risen to the top of their professions. Dr. Eva Brennan and Dr. Pradeep Sabati are rock stars in the biotech world. Their respective company and lab are creating medicines with new technologies that will tackle some of the world's most incurable diseases as well as vaccines for, dare we say, the next pandemic. They will share their trajectory, their philosophy, and their advice with Radio Boston host Tiziana Deering, our moderator for this series, and no stranger to being a woman who has climbed the ladder in fields dominated by men. Take it away, Tiziana. Thank you, Amy and uh, Aoife and Pardis. I'm so excited to have you here. Looking forward to this conversation. Uh, and, and I wanna dive right in with a question that I'm gonna ask each of you. Aoife, I'll, I'll go to you first. I want you to go back as far as you can in your life to the first time that you really kind of broke a graph, glass ceiling or defied an expectation of something girls do or don't do. What was the very first time? Yeah, um, so I've been reflecting on this a lot recently, and I think that most of my insights about myself have come in hearing myself reflected on someone else. If you, you know, somebody puts tries to put me in a box, and I react to that by saying, "Hold on a second, you've got me wrong." And the first time that happened was in high school, when um, you know I, I grew up in Ireland. I, I went to um, high school, a Catholic girls' high school, very traditional. You know, we did home economics, not a huge focus on the sciences. And um, when I went to my career guidance counselor and, you know, we were exploring what I might like to do. And she thought, well, you know, you're going to want to get married soon and have a family. You know, I think a job where you can have the summers off, like teaching could be a really good fit for you. And I'm like, hold on a sec. You know, this, this is not me. You haven't listened to what I like to do. You haven't, you don't know anything about me and just had a really negative reaction, but I knew enough to not push back and to just nod and agree um, in the moment. But I think it actually triggered something in me to push back against that definition or that box that I was, you know, being, being conveniently placed into and actually forced me to, to really think about myself and what it was I wanted to do. And I think that was the first time I realized, well, you know, not all adults know what's best for you. Not all adults give good advice. Not everyone <laughs> will give you. She was very well intentioned, but, um, and I didn't necessarily have an obligation to follow it. So I think that was the first kind of career rebellion, if you will, um, growing up and, and really pushed me to work harder, to, you know, be more ambitious. Um, so maybe had the opposite to uh, effect in terms of what she, was, what she was thinking of me. So I think that's the earliest example I can think of. And looking back over my um, my life to date, how about you, Pardis? Um, yeah, I just thought of two examples. It's funny because it's not necessarily in in like my job or my career where I felt that kind of like girls don't do that kind of feeling. I mean, obviously, you you come across it in many ways in your life more insidiously as you get in in life and work. Uh, the funny thing is, I would say like I have two really like clear memories of. Um, just one day, uh, I was like in sixth or seventh grade and, um, the boys would always play football like during lunch. And, you know, one day somebody invited me to play or something. And I went and I played and I just, I remember just, I fell in love with it. Like I loved it so much. I was like, oh my God, I want to do this every single day. And I just like came out and I was so excited. I just had, it's like literally like the light turned on and it was like the funnest experience I ever had. And I remember going often I'm having the cool I was very uncool and the cool girls like wanting to talk to me and I'm like oh my gosh like oh, hi and they're like yeah what are you doing and I was like oh, oh my god and I'm playing football it's like so fun you guys should come play and they're like no like girls don't do that and they're just like so disgusted with me they're just saying girls don't do that um and uh I mean this I don't know if it's going to give away something to, about me but then later I, w I went to a I went to like a, I love concerts and the same thing happened where I went to a concert and I like the mosh pit. I used to like the mosh pit and I was in the mosh pit and I was like having this up. This is so fun. Like we're all just banging against each other. It's really fun. And 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 I, I came out and one of the popular girls was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you even doing? And I was like, it's so fun. You got to try this. And uh, and it's, it's interesting to me, like the, the two experiences I have are other women telling me what I was and was not allowed to be doing. Um, and uh, and I was a, I was like a painfully oblivious person, which is why I was quite 
unpop I, I was like popular unpopular like all the popular boys liked me in math class but then like made fun of me outside of math class and it was like a, I was that kind of a weird kid um, that was popular in classrooms and very popular at the lunchroom um, but uh, I think um, you, you do realize like how much we all self censor um, behaviors and tell each other what not to do and and that's actually been I mean in a lot of my life I think a lot of that is you know it's so interesting who's holding you back and it's not always the people you expect. Aoife, nodding, chuckling there, so let me let you just pick up on that. I'm thinking maybe that's why she ended up in academic medicine, the love of the marsh pit. <laughs> that, was, that was mine. I could be a masochist a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's something that we all need to be super conscious of, that we don't inadvertently, you know, box somebody else in or inadvertently give those cues. I think we're all kind of mature enough now to not kind of give somebody that that's not something girls do feedback overtly. But I do think there's probably a lot of signals we give off um, to girls, to, you know, people starting out in their career journey who are maybe looking for reassurance from more established leaders. And, and I think it's something just that we have to be super conscious about, right? That we don't give off the girls don't do that signal um, to others coming up, coming up through the ranks. So uh, I think I was, uh, you know, really reflecting on, on that feedback and those experiences you had, Pardis. So Pardis, we had an audience member who just wants to know what the concert was. Who was the band? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was gonna. I think it was Ice Tea and the Body Count. Um, is what Ice I'm Tea and the Body Count. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Um, I uh, yeah, or like Ministry or something ridiculous. Uh, but yeah. All right, we got to stay in that space. Eva, first concert you remember going to? I actually, my but, sister sent me a picture recently. I went to Guns and Roses. They came to Slane Castle in Dublin. I know that the sound. There's one sound engineer on this call who who knows where that is in 1992 maybe um and i was of course in love with axel rose at the time and i remember being right up front pretty decent <laughs> in the mosh pit it was an absolutely nice. fabulous day so um yeah that's yeah that was my first concert experience i think this is a thread in these discussions i had not expected to pick up on but will be in the future for sure <laughs> absolutely absolutely like a good way to kick it off so um yeah I mean, that was not my first concert. That was my first concert. I didn't immediately walk in and start moshing in my first concert ever. I, you know, but, uh, but it was the first concert. I think I like got into the mosh pit. So I want to stay in this space. And there is one other question kind of as we, as we start here that I want to ask each of you. And, and I may stay with each of you a little bit and follow. So just, just bear with me. And Pardis, I'll ask you first this time. Do you see yourself as a woman leader or do you see yourself as a leader who is a woman? I don't know if I have that kind of resolution. Like, I don't know if I would say that I, I know the answer to that question. Uh, so this might be a very short, <laughs> short line with me. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think I, I would say that, that I, I, the, the older other, you know, other than those kinds of examples of sort of signals those cues that you get in middle school that was rough like going through my professional life I actually didn't ever feel as if I was a woman or like I didn't have that sense um yeah and like I said in the classroom like that like all through life it's like in the classroom everything was different like in the classroom I was respected and appreciated and um even like you know people were really nice to like there's actually this kind of funny thing where it's like in the classroom they're all like super duper nice to me and everyone was really fun and so it was like in that way, like in my professional life, I've never thought like man or woman, people just sort of like took it at face value. Um, and only in the last few years, like as you get older and or older, like graduate school is probably the first time I started to sense I was a woman. Um, and just by, by way, the way we were treated um, and how stark it was, like this was Oxford circa like late 1990s. It was just a very, very, um, gendered place and you were reminded on a regular basis that you were a woman doing science so i think that kind of is where it started and probably over time you reminded enough times in diff in many different ways that you were a woman doing this and uh, and and i would say like as i get older like that it's it gets more ridiculous um and frustrating and so i think there's a certain point where you say okay you know what like i am a woman i'm gonna embrace that i guess i never really i'm not i i'm 
I'm not somebody who really thinks about gender in my like life and, and, you know, and, uh, and appreciate, you know, gender fluidity, gender, uh, like gender, you know, I just don't really think about it. Like, I don't know. I'm in a, I'm not thinking I'm in a room with women or I'm in a room with men. I'm just, it's not the way I sort of see things. So it's never been something that's on my mind. Um, uh, and, and mostly probably, and also like having been so much of my life, like for whatever reason, every like advanced math track I was in, I was oftentimes uh, the sole woman in a room full of boys that I just did. I like lost the perspective of what my gender was. Um, anyway, but also to say like um, in the last decades, particularly like as a faculty, you're just reminded so often that you're a woman and that you then you finally like embrace it. And, uh, and so I would probably say the answer to that question is it, it's changed. Uh, before I was just uh, a person in science who happened to be a woman. And now I'm like, no, I'm a woman doing science. And, I'm a, and, and, and uh, you know, but I, I'd like to get back to the place, I think, where I'm just a person doing science who happens to be a woman. I, I'm just, we're just not there yet until we're not there yet. We actually need some people to stand up and say, um, you know, uh, to sort of speak for us. So I think that's what I'll, I, I try to do where I can. And how about you, Eva? Yeah, I mean, I, I like parties. I really want to get to the place where gender is not a qualifier for leadership or gender is not a qualifier for, you know, whatever role you're playing professionally. Um, but I'm torn because in order to break through to that place where, you know, it's irrelevant, you know, your gender identity is irrelevant to, you know, your, your profession and, and what you're achieving professionally, we have to go through a place where we break the biases about, you know, what does a leader look like? What does a chairman, what does the CEO look like? What does an MIT professor look like? And the only way we get to that place is through representation. So while I really want to get to a place where it's irrelevant, I do realize that there's going to be a, a sequence of things we have to go through to make sure that there is gender representation on panels, that we don't have manuals, that we're seeing awards are being awarded to you know, mixed genders and races and, and everything else, because representation is so important to breaking those biases. And we all have them, you know, we all have these ingrained ideas and they come out. Sometimes I'm disgusted at myself because you catch yourself doing it. You're like, oh my goodness, that's, you know, my deep subconscious making that connection of, you know, what that phenotype is, you know, that's suitable for chairman or that's suitable for CEO or suitable for CFO or whatever role it is. So, you know, it, it, it's a very complex issue and I think it's challenging and it's a, a long-term dream. We get to the irrelevant place, but in the meantime, the only way we'll get there is by making it relevant. And so that we make sure that we have that representation to break down those biases that we all have just kind of because of our upbringing and the social cues that are all around us. Um, you know, I think it's going to take some time. Go ahead, Pardis. I saw you wanted to add in. Oh yeah, you know, I will. I, I started to, and then I was like, man, no, I'll hold back because it, it's it's great. Everything you're saying, I'm I'm totally on board. Although the one counterpoint I will say to that is, yeah, it's true. Like we obviously want to be there and be representing and and be available so other people can see. Like this is what it is, but also have to be true to what it is. Like I, I have found, like you know, the the number of times I've been asked to be on panels where every person on that panel has been awarded something except for me, me and the other women, uh, it's exhausting. It's so exhausting. It's like, here's all the people we funded and we gave you a baby grant just to like, you know, kiddo, you got some potential. And there you are either a guest speaker or a seedling grant because that's just the way they see you. Um, so at one point when I kind of have my, I have like a little, every once in a while I have my like, if I had a fake Twitter, what it would say. And I, I think one of the lines I came up with is, if you're on a panel and you're the only person on that stage that hasn't been supported by the, uh, you know, the the organizer, it's not representation, it's exploitation, like get out of there. And I do feel like that happens all the time where they're like, we just want to see you. We want to see you. And I, I remember at some point I told one very you know big foundation, I was like, you know, I'm not an outbreak entertainer, right? You, you understand that I actually have like work I do, um, but they just always want to see you there and they show and I showcase you. And, and to me, I'm like, you know what, be honest about it. Like you got all men, you feel like the, that all men are going to do this, then just showcase those men and get me. And I have to go back and do my own work and raise my own funds. So good luck with that. Like, I actually want to be a little bit mindful that we don't do the kind of tokenism, feel good stuff that actually ends up burdening women more because they're asked to be on every single panel because they have to make it look like we have representation when we don't. So anyway, that's all to say, like very different. And I, as I'm saying that, like very different from this kind of an event where it's like, we are 
talking about the real stuff, but it's so often in these kind of other types of meetings, they just grab you to like make it look like they're doing a good job. But when you look under the hood, it's um, it's really kind of rough. So. Eva. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking back to a an, an episode early on in my career. I stepped into being CEO of my current company. I was the chief medical officer and was promoted. And one of my first calls was with one of our big shareholders who spent the first 15 minutes telling me how excited they were. They hadn't had a portfolio company with a CEO who's female. They were so thrilled. They were going to put me up on their website straight away, blah, blah. And then at the end of the call, oh, by the way, I'm also just letting you know that we're exiting our position in your stock. <laughs> like, do you not know how this how this world works? <laughs> you know, it was this gushing, you know, and how thrilled they were and how it was great. They'd been searching to have a, a, a female um, leader of a portfolio company. And I was on their website for probably, you know, a couple of years after they had completely exited their position. And it was just kind of this disconnect, like you're speaking to parties of like, it's, it's not necessarily quantity and we can't have bean counting. It has to be also an element of quality. Um, to really get there so that it doesn't become just to check the box and you almost have two tiers because that's you know we would all die if 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 something like that happened but um yeah certainly something that that you encounter for sure so Aoife we have a follow-up question from the audience you talked earlier about you'd like to be at the stage where it doesn't matter right and so they're saying so what would it take for you to just be a person in science that happens to be a woman yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the stats for um, CEOs of biotech companies, there are about 700 publicly traded biotech companies. I just went through the data myself for another reason. There are only 61 where there's a female CEO. And um, so that's less than 10% of, of biotech companies that have a female CEO. And, you know, I think the biotech industry is 50-50. Most biotech companies have 50% of, of each gender. So we have issues on race and all of other things. You know, we have to build a pipeline. But when you look at like companies on average have 50% of employees are female. So for me, I think to get to a place where it doesn't matter anymore, you know, everyone highlights these phenomenal women like Pardis, right? Who are like superstars, excel all the way through, consistent delivery, amazing. And they're, you know, but they're, they're kind of outliers. You need to have a mediocre woman has the same opportunities as a mediocre man. Then we'll know we've gotten there. Like stop highlighting these like outlier, you know, the few who make it through this amazingly difficult path. And I think when we've achieved that, when a, you know, B, B player woman is the same opportunity as a B player man, I think we'll, we'll I'll feel certainly that, that we've gotten there. Because right now, you know, what you're seeing is, you know, men who are only okay are kind of getting promoted and, and you know, go, going through the ranks. I think we all have experience of observing that, right, where somebody just fails to deliver and this concept of failing up happens, you know, so you fail at one job, so we're going to give you an even bigger job. And that never happens to women, you know, it's, and you end up with this situation where you've all these like amazing women on a par with like, you know, um, you know, some, some amazing men, for sure, there are men I hugely admire, but then there are a lot of others, right? And uh, I think for me, it's when, when we get to that place, I'll finally feel like gender has become irrelevant. But when you look at the statistics and the data, you know, in, in my industry, we're, we're very far away from, from being there. So it's interesting because on the one hand, one wants to say, well, wouldn't it be great if we were in a place where we were true meritocracy? And again, that's a, that is a concept that has meant very specific things that have kept a lot of excellence out. Uh, over the generations, and I want to acknowledge that. But that's different than you can do as well failing forward as a woman as you do failing forward as a man. And I, I wonder if we are beginning now, and Nifa, you just gave us some statistics there. I had brought some, uh, I had brought some with me as well, you know, in labs. In labs run by men, 47% of the graduate students are female, 36% of the postdocs are female, but in labs run by women, those numbers go up right? You've talked about representation. Where do we get to the point where there is a path for all excellence? Um, and where, where women pardis who are achieving excellence in a field like biotech, um, there's enough room at the top that the top achievers go as far as they can go. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I just know we're not there. I, I you know, recently, I, there's like this thing, there's like, I have a, a bruising thing that I won't give the details of, but like where uh, a foundation I was working with for several years um, to try to get them to fund the program that I had um, and pitching it to them and convincing them that they should be in the space and working on it. 
And um, they ended up basically taking my idea and giving it to two men who had never done anything in that space before. And I, and I had a huge track record in the space, uh, like huge, you know, that was my, that was my track record. It was like, that's what I do. It's, it's what I do. It's what I do all day long. It's what I did every, you know, every day. It's what all my recognition comes from. And I was like, in what world would that ever happen? Would somebody be like, Hey, there's this person that, that has this expertise. It's their idea. It's actually like their words on the page that we are going to follow, but we are going to give it to you two gentlemen, even though you've never experienced this in, in uh, before, like literally when I thought about it, I was like the, 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 the clear skill they had actually never done before. And in my mind, I mean, I, it was, it's sometimes it's refreshing because I, I had something else happen recently that was similar, like where it's like on, on no information, they're just like, yeah, just not you. And that I've, I've been told by a lot of people with like, um, particularly women, uh, uh, women of color, like it's so exhausting to go to uh, VCs over and over again and hear like, you have too much data, you have too little data, you have too much, you know, this, you have too little, and you see people just trying to say the words, just not you, you know, whatever it is, just not you. And, um, and I guess I said, I've had a couple of times in my life, it's been very refreshingly, we want everything about this program, but you. Um, and uh, I mean, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad, that it's actually like, I mean, we're not, it was like, we're laughably far from where we're supposed to be. And it's so insidious now, right where it's like it, they can do that they can be like oh there's just something about this i can't quite put my finger on it um that i'm just not convinced by and it's like literally i just can't quite figure it out and so in those i think actually sometimes in those rare instances when it's so obvious when they take your work and give it to two people who've never done it before where you're like well okay yeah it's a wrap you know and um i don't even know if that was your <laughs> i think i went off like it was not exactly what your question was but i think i was just yeah, but I love the answer. And I'm going to yeah. let Aoife pick up on it. And then I want to flex. So I'm going to let Aoife, I yeah. want you to pick up on this. And then we're going to go back and we're going to really try to explain in lay terms for our listeners what it is actually you do do. So, but Aoife, <laughs> let me pick, have you pick up on Pardis first there. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, in some ways it's kind of, it's depressing when something like that happens, but it's somehow kind of validating too, because there's so many instances where it's subtle and you end up thinking, am I being you know, too strident here, you know, it's something subtle happens and you're like, would they have done that if it was a guy up here pitching or would they have done that? And you never have kind of the evidence when something like this happens, like what you described, Pardis, in terms yeah. of your, it's kind of like, ha, huh, I knew it, I was right. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of validates some of the more subtle um, instances that, that you kind of, that, that happen in your career. And it kind of makes you feel like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not some like crazy bra burner who is, you know, yeah. you know, going to, uh, you know, some kind of a nutcase feminist. It, this is actually a real problem for, for women. So it, it can kind of be reassuring. So stay with, let's stay with you, Aoife, for a minute and explain in lay terms, right? What you do. So um, I'm CEO of a company called Synlogic. We're based here in Kendall Square, right across the, the street from Pardis at MIT. Um, we're a spin out of, of MIT. The two founders were actually MIT, two male MIT faculty, Jim Collins and Tim Liu. Um, and what we do is we apply synthetic biology to bacteria. And the goal is to develop a new century class, a new modality of medicines, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Very few, you know, truly novel modalities actually make it all the way to be in treatments for patients. Um, I started out as chief medical officer. I became chief executive officer a couple of years into my tenure. And uh, we had really exciting data last year that shows us that actually we're having an impact of patients with disease. So that was kind of, it, it took us five years to get that evidence that we really could move the needle on an important endpoint for patients. So that was just a hugely gratifying um, accomplishment uh, of the company um, that, that, we've, that we've been through. So it's, it's been a really fun ride. I've learned a ton about myself and about business and, and biotech. I'm a scientist, an R&D girl in, in my heart, but it's been really fun to learn about this new ecosystem around what ideas get funded, how investors think about opportunities, you know, how they uh, perceive risk, all those kinds of things have been really fun to, to learn. And I'm gonna I'm gonna allow my ignorance to really show here, but as I understand it, and you may tell me I'm wrong, what you're talking about with the new modality, as I understand it, is the bacteria actually becoming part of the delivery mechanism for the medicine. Do, do I understand Correct. that correctly? Correct, absolutely. Yes, we engineer probiotics. So a lot of people around the world take probiotics as a daily supplement. We 
engineer them to perform specific functions that are missing or damaged due to disease. So that's you know what what our platform is. It's it's amazingly plastic platform. It really is kind of cutting edge. But when you're trying to do something new, you have to pave the way. No one's ever done this before. There's no recipe book or pathway. So we're constantly you know, working out how to overcome manufacturing challenges, how to find a pathway with regulators because there is no precedent. So we're often the ones defining the precedent for other companies that are interested in pursuing some similar opportunities coming along behind. Um, so it, it, it's been, it's, it's really fun, very challenging. It's definitely engaging. And I think if we succeed, we'll be incredibly rewarding because we can think about diseases in new ways, um, you know, and hopefully bring treatments to patients who are um, currently suffering and, and don't really have good treatment options. So Pardis, explain now uh, to the, you know, to the extent that you can for a person who's not in your field, what it is you do. Sure. Um, so I am uh, so an MD PhD who um, whose PhD research work is in um, computational genetics. So I develop tools and technologies to mine the genome of humans and the microorganisms that infect humans to try to understand um, clues uh, that could impact human health. Um, and uh, and so you know in in our lab we have a lot of physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians, but also bioengineers. We're just, we're basically just like mining and uh, interpreting and also developing uh, tools around uh, our genomes uh, and genome, uh, genomic ways to, to improve human health. And, and kind of a, and a big part of my uh, career has been mining the genomes of the viruses that infect humans, um, pathogens infect humans, but um, a lot of the kind of early work we did was during the Ebola outbreak, during Zika, Lassa, uh, mumps, um, SARS-CoV-2, but um, sequencing the genomes of these viruses, understanding, you know, helping to improve diagnostic vaccines and therapies, and also track the viruses, determine their origins, all of those kinds of things that they call genomic epidemiology, um, but really using genomic information to help kind of respond to, to outbreaks. Um, so that's kind of one of the big things I do, but we do also do a lot of stuff that's still continuing to mine the human genome and develop therapies uh, for humans as well. So uh, in preparing for this, I watched a 2013 video that you did for National Geographic about whether math can beat disease. And it was unsettling to watch this 2013 video where you talk about, you were talking about Lassa virus at the time, but you know, tracking how a disease morphs, how a virus morphs. Uh, the things that you said sounded like 2019 and 2020. It sounded like you were planning for and preparing for what then hit us. And in watching this, I'm thinking, okay, that was seven years before, and she knew. So you knew. So how, how did we not know? You know, how did we, how were we so unable to, and maybe I'm wrong, but unable to pick up the lessons of the work that had been done a decade before around um, tracking how a virus morphs and changes and spreads um, to this yeah. virus that changed the world. Um, you know, I mean, it's funny actually, because I mean, it's not like, I mean, I, people have known, I mean, we've all known since the beginning of time, like uh, the, the, that infectious diseases are the major causes of morbidity, mortality, and economic loss of human populations ever. I mean, it's actually like, that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's not even, it's obvious. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't some sort of a savant to know that. I mean, obviously I just went deep into an area. I think I'm good at, re at identifying um, like uh, um, neglected topics, you know, like I think I, I like always like to go off the beaten track. So it's sort of like when human genetics got when, so, so when a lot of the work in human genetics was not good, I was like all in. And then I developed a bunch of algorithms that kind of made my early career. And then as soon as it got hot, I'm like, okay, this is boring now. And I went to like viruses when nobody would work in that field and nobody published anywhere. And I was like, this seems like it needs some attention. And, and, and I might actually leave the field now because I'm like, now that I'm, and, you know, it's actually, I should say, it's not that I'm quite bored. It's also that as a woman, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, once it becomes a power game, uh, I, I don't win in that game. You know, nobody wants me at the table. No one wants me leading. It, it's pretty clear. Um, I've, I've been told that many times that I don't have a lack gravitas and people need gravitas to follow suit. And so then I'll be like, you know what, I'll go and identify the next um, like uh, uh, neglected topic. But, you know, it's not, it, I was not, 
had some sort of a genius to know that pandemics were going to come. It's like, it's obvious poor Lori Garrett has been on this, you know, uh, on this for decades before me. And um, people have been talking about this for a really long time. I think this is the first time the whole world gets it, but they don't even get the whole story. Like what's frustrating is that they get part of it, but uh, nobody wants it. Like people are like, okay, COVID, COVID, but nobody then wants to like prepare for anything else that might come. It's, we're, we're very, very interesting as a, you know, humanity, we're very interesting and just really wanting to focus like what's right in front of our face and not really being, um, I don't know, proactive, I would probably say is the word. Um, and I don't think that there is a lot of money to be made in prevention, right? If you never hear about an outbreak, um, no, there's no glory in it, there's no money in it. And so creating tools that really prevent something from happening is not really, uh, sadly, of that much interest. Um, yes. Uh, and I'll ask you both that. Uh, Pardis, you were just talking about, you know, humanity doesn't only looks at what's right in front of their faces. I, I think we have seen at least some examples of human cultures over m millennia that are very good at thinking long term. But what I hear, I think, is that the money isn't good at thinking long term. And you have both now, and if I'll turn to you here, you have both sounded the alarm several times in 30 minutes about the myopia of funding and the challenges of funding that are partly maybe a, afraid of something new, but partly afraid of the woman who's bringing that something new to the table, Aoife. Yeah, I think, you know, I've just finished a great book called The Good Ancestor, which I think gets to exactly what you're talking about, Pradeez. And it's, it was fascinating to read the kind of financial underpinnings of how we make decisions about long-term investments and how the um, opportunity, you know, how we calculate return on investment today and how you have to discount future gains, which is so myopic, right? So that you yeah. could have a huge saving over time. And it's a really amazing book. They highlight some successes, right? Some amazing individuals who've managed to make a great case like the London sewer system, for instance, you know, it's been, it was a huge investment. They over-invested at the time, but it's still operational today. So there's some great examples of times when long-term thinking really did prevail, but it doesn't happen very frequently. And I think gender diversity, um, you know, equality, equal access, opportunity, planning for the future, making sure that we're making changes now that allow, you know, girls who are born today will have different choices than, you know, will face different challenges than we do. It's kind of similar, you know, you have to create some sense of urgency, some need to make this investment and it kind of ebbs and flows, you know, comes in fashion and suddenly everyone's all about, you know, more women on boards and everything else. And then it kind of fades back and we go back to our, our system and, you know, this, this book makes the analogy of like the, the big stink in London where, you know, there was all this sewage in the, uh, in the River Thames and that was until it wafted into the House of Parliament did the, you know, decision makers realize, okay, we need to make some investment. And, you know, there are episodes of the big stink and maybe COVID was one of those where we realized, wow, we're dependent on childcare. We're actually dependent on these females coming into work every day. I was hopeful that that would kind of be our big stink moment, right, where we could actually mm. fix some fundamental structural things that are very challenging for professional women. Um, you know, it kind of seems to be fading as COVID is becoming less of a daily threat. Um, so I go from being very optimistic <laughs> to being, you know, pessimistic that there really is that stickiness to implement some of the changes that I think are needed in order to, uh, to really improve over the long term. Bernice, let me give you a chance to react to that. I mean, yeah, I think she's just preach, you know, like, yeah, 100%. I, mean, I think it's, it's I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to come into this and also be like so negative, you know, because I'm finding myself just in, in this, like giving you a lot of hard knock stuff. And like, I, I have a lot of really great success stories. I have a lot of really amazing men and women that I work with. Um, I have, there's a lot of really great opportunity ahead. So, I mean, I, I should tell you, like, you know, most of what I would say is very positive. Um, I think it's just also important to be honest about the realities and what we live in. And I mean, yeah, so I, I think it was because when he was talking, I had like another memory where I got very, uh, I got upset because they were talking about like why um, their women weren't like doing as much and being as successful and, and making as much of a statement in COVID. Like why suddenly all of a sudden, like all of the people that were, we were all listening to were men for a long time. And given that actually, if you look at infectious disease, when I was in medical school and in research, like women are somehow really drawn to infectious disease. There's a lot of women in infectious disease, but suddenly like crickets, like you didn't hear from any of any of us. Um, and 
this person who was trying to write about it and was talking about like all the troubles of like why it's so terrible that we don't have women and kind of kept pointing to all the self-censoring reasons we don't have women like they don't have child care and they didn't have that kind of support and I was like hold your horses you stop that like I was like I want to be very clear with you like nobody cares about my family and my family responsibilities that's not what's holding me back I'm like I'm working seven days a week you know 16 hours a day like every single day don't suddenly feel sorry for me and tell me oh society and the world is holding me back you're holding me back you by like pu pushing me out of every single room dropping me from all funding telling my colleagues like my female colleagues that they need to step out of this one and let the men take charge literally saying those words that's what's holding me back and so uh you know there are all so i should say like there are all these societal things that are struggles and child care is a mess and and we need to deal with that but we also need to like make sure we disentangle that from things that are straight up holding women and, and minorities back. Um, and it's literally just not having resources. It's simple, right? If you give $100 million to a man and $500,000 to, you know, like a woman, we will work our tails off, but we will lose. It'll, the David and Goliath is just not real. Like you will get squashed. Like stop romanticizing these stories. Like, no, if you don't give resources to people, they don't succeed. That's it. So, um, Anyway, I, I ended up getting negative again. It just happened. But my point is a lot of great experiences, but also these things should be said. Um, yeah, sorry. All right. So yeah. let's let let's just uh take a break for just a second. There's so many yes, themes I still want to pick up on, but I just want to play for a second. So we're gonna yeah. do a little bit of a lightning round, just quick one sentence answers. Um uh Aoife, favorite way to recharge your battery. A walk in in the woods with the dog you know away from everything no phone no nothing just me and the dog in the woods and i tell her all kinds of secrets and she never tells anyone <laughs> it's, it's all good how about you pardis um exercise of some sort i mean so just uh using my body and and kind of just like ha having that be the the main thing going on and pardis if there were a woman in history you could meet who would you meet uh i mean mary curie of course it's just i mean that woman is such a like rock i would say like everything about her i'm just like how what you're unbelievable so um yeah there's many but i mary curie i just want to know yeah how she and how about you how about you Aoife? Yeah, the person i always wanted to meet growing up was madeline albright and she died recently because you know as i was kind of you know, as a high school kind of young professional, I would always look at these pictures and she was the one woman who was unapologetic about her femininity. You know, there's always these pictures of like all the gray suits or all the navy suits. And then there she was in this bright pink with pearls and, you know, this bright pink outfit. And she never, you know, she, she didn't ever seem to make an attempt to fit in. So, so many other women that were public figures as I was growing up just kind of were apologetic they were trying to blend in were apologetic about being female but she always had this kind of motherly unapologetically female but also you know tough as nails get stuff done persona that i just personally really identified with and i just had always wanted i just loved to have a coffee with her and to like learn and hear some of the war stories i think she'd be phenomenal okay so i'm so glad you brought that up too because this is a tricky one and i want to dive into it a little bit femininity is a complicated concept um, and for women in leadership grappling with expectations of femininity uh, especially as we increasingly understand gender fluidity uh, people's ability to choose how they identify um, and the need to stop ascribing so heavily uh, you know both gender identity and gender norms how do you think about femininity is it is it a piece of your life is it a piece of how you engage in your work is there a, there's a is there a feminine womanhood that comes to mix is that an outdated concept is that something that stays somewhere else in your life I, i'm really curious how you think about it pardis i'll let you pick up yeah i mean i think um I, I'm one of those pe people that like uh, like wear sweatpants would wear sweatpants every single day. Uh, like you know, I, I'm just. Uh, but then, it, but if there's like a gala, I'll, I'll like do it up. I get really excited for. So it's sort of like I like to be feminine, but kind of like like a vampire, just like once every while, just be like, okay, I did that. Um, and I'm I'm pretty like 
so I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't see myself as particularly feminine, um, but I do, I do realize I have a lot of feminine traits and I enjoy and embrace them. Um, uh, kind of a deep level of like mama bear to my lab um, and a deep level of like empathy with everybody that I interact with. And so, uh, you know, I, I, we think about it, right? When women came into the workforce, like how many things changed, how many social drivers changed when we really were at the conversation and we could not, so lead in a lot of ways where we, you know, started um, driving society in a better direction and a more kind and caring direction, but also just coming up with ideas that are uniquely female to do so. Um, and so I embrace that part of uh, myself that is feminine, that has ideas that come from being a woman and, and living, embodying the pieces. Um, but, uh, but, but it, like I said, it's not, it's not something that I'm constantly coming with, but I do more and more appreciate you know, bringing that to bear to, in, the, in my life and in my practice. Eva, pick up on that. You know, I think the most important thing for me is to be authentic for yourself because, you know, particularly in small companies, I, I work in small biotech companies, you know, the team here can sniff out lack of authenticity in a moment. So even if I was, to, you know, decide that to succeed, I would need to have a more macho, hard charging persona or, you know, something else. It's not going to work because, you know, it just it, you, you have to present as your authentic self. I think society owes us all to adapt to us, you know, being able to thrive as our authentic selves. So I think that's just, it's self-defeating thing to try and alter your persona in order to fit some kind of, you know, idea of, of what you think a leader should be. Um, having said that, I, I sometimes wonder for myself is, you know, I'm, I'm feminine, but not too feminine, you know, and maybe I'm part of the problem and that, you know, I'm the one who made it through because, you know, I'm, I'm girly, but not too girly. I try, I do try to bring out and to be very vocal about, you know, the fact that I'm a mom, I have small kids at home, everyone in the company knows that, you know, I have kids, everyone I interact with professionally. I remember a talk that it was kind of one of my first, you know, big talks, I, I worked at Biogen for five years before coming here and I had an opportunity to give a talk about a topic and uh, I was speaking to some one of my female colleagues and mentor and I said, you know, I'm going to make the theme of this topic it was kind of like almost like a TED talk. I'm going to make the theme of this topic about how developing a drug is like giving birth to a baby. And she was horrified. She said, oh my God, that is a terrible idea. It's going to damage your career. You have to make a sports analogy, a war analogy, all fine. An analogy to labor and delivery, not okay. You know, it's too, too out there, too female, too rubbing people's faces, noses in it. And I had to really reflect. I'm like, do I try to, you know, do some kind of like, you know, make it Olympics or make it some kind of more masculine thing? And I'm like, no, you know what? Like I've had three kids. I'm, you know, so many people will identify with it, with this analogy. Um, at least 50% of the people in the room will. So I kind of went out on a limb, but it felt like I was taking a big risk, you know, despite the fact that I listened to, you know, all of these sports analogies every day in business, right? Like the home run, slam dunk, you know, you're constantly, you know, it's, if one person, another person quotes Sun Tzu to me, I'll go crazy, right? So it's constantly- Art of war, these, just a- yeah, Art of war, yeah, yeah. Um, every, you know, it's, we're constantly surrounded by language that's, you know, just has very masculine origins. And, uh, you know, I, I, I went, I did it, it felt risky, but, you know, I, I think it went over okay. Um, and that gave me courage to be, you know, to double down to be even more kind of unapologetic I guess about it and not try to hide it or to uh, pretend that my my kids don't exist um, or, or you know something else so I, I made that calculus with myself that I wasn't willing to sacrifice who I was in order to succeed professionally I was just going to give it my all and be myself and see what happened um, and that's kind of been my um, modus operandi if you will. Did that talk go well? Yes, I think it went well. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I got some positive uh, feedback. I remember the CEO at the time, George Skangos, walked into the back of the room just as I was starting to give the talk. And I had this like sinking feeling like, oh my God, this could be career suicide, you know, if it doesn't go well. But you know, I, th I, I think it, the analogy worked, hopefully, and, uh, and it didn't come across too um, scary to, to men in the room. Let's talk about joy in your field. This is a question from an audience member. What is your favorite part of the biotech industry? What brings you joy in your field? So where's the joy coming from for you, Pardis? Um, I mean, the joy is just having an idea and, and playing it out and getting to tease it out. I mean, I, I was just talking to a student today about just um, like how fun it is to have like a crackpot idea that you just like 
can't stop thinking about until like you just, you know, tease it out. And every morning you wake up with another thought and another thought and your brain is like solving the problem when you're sleeping. I mean, there's just so much joy in that. It's really, it's, it's like just getting to solve a puzzle all day long, you know, in, in your job. And so for the, those who like puzzles, it's like the greatest job in the world. Like it really is. Um, and, uh, and just fun to really get excellent at it. And, and also the joys of working with really smart people trying to solve those puzzles too. Um, so it, there's, there's so much joy in a job. It's not for everybody. Um, you got to really enjoy failure too. And to be able to laugh hard when like things go really rock bottom and to, to sort of, uh, to see each kind of thing is just another opportunity to learn. But if you like that, um, and I'm the kind of person who actually likes that, I, 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 I um, I don't fear failure and I, and I like, like going out on, ri on, ri like, uh, on a limb and and finding out how like if I'm right or I'm wrong wrong and trying to get to just better um you kind of constantly get to learn to get better at at solving those pro pro puzzles until you can find something so there's I mean it's a very very fun field to be and I, I often say it's like being a kid in the candy store like every time you turn around it's like another cool phenomenal thing and if I had like 10 lifetimes I would have an I'd still wouldn't have enough time to do all the stuff I want to do as far as science goes so from that that perspective uh, it's a really great job Where's the joy for you, Eva? Yeah, I agree 100%. It's a lot of the problem solving and the being able to come together as a team to crack a nut, you know, with, with the problem. And sometimes when people come asking, you know, well, how do I know biotech is for me? How do I know technical development is for me? I described them saying, okay, if you're getting a data set, you know, you do a study, it takes you two, two years to enroll a trial, you get the data, it's been analyzed in India, you know that it's due in at 1 a.m. in the morning. If you're the kind of person who wants to set your alarm clock at 1 a.m. and get up and log on and look at that data right as soon as you can, because that's you know, everything for you, then you know this is the right job. If you're like, oh, I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow, whatever, you know, that, that's probably not because you have to, you have to, it's so hard um, and there's so many challenges, so much failure along the way. But those moments, and I've had maybe three or four in my, in my professional career where you're, you've executed this incredibly difficult program with a small group of people who are like you know your family by the end of it you know you've usually been working on this for like three four years every day and night thinking about what we can do next and you're in that room with them and you're you know opening the data together for the first time and it's almost like spiritual experience right when you've been in that room with this team who know each other so well and you're catching eye contact as people are flicking through the pages and the data looks amazing and it's exactly what you thought it would look like. Just that experience, it's almost like being present at the birth of a child or something. You know, it's kind of that, that level of spirituality and it's just so amazing. And once you've had that experience with a group, I can remember back on all the trial readouts and some don't go your way, right? And some you open up and it's like, oh, you know, and you're dealing with as a small team, you have this opportunity to, to cope and then you have to go tell the world. But on those occasions when it works, it creates just this bond with that team, right? That, you know, I know for the rest of my career, I can call up any one of them and we get right back to, you know, the kind of relationship we had back in the day because we have that kind of experience together of just not knowing and the uncertainty of like, oh, it could go our way. It may be great, it may be bad. It may be somewhere in the middle where we, you know, didn't do the right study or we made some assumption that didn't hold true. Um, but that's, you know, the real joy in, in drug development. And we've had, some experience of that, you know, I think that the vaccine data, you know, I can only imagine what the people at Moderna and Pfizer, were, you know, that those people who first cracked that data set, you know, that the experience that they had, but that's the real, you know, that, that's what we live for as, as drug developers and in biotech. Before I go to my next question, Pardis, is there anything you want to pick up on from there? No, just that was a joy to listen to. Yeah, well, you yeah, it's yeah. And seeing the two of you light up, right, in talking about that, um, there, is a, there is a curiosity and a hunger to poke at things that I see in the two of you, to, to poke it and prod it and stretch it and know, and if you don't know, try again. And there's, there's both a curiosity and a resilience to that that strike me as they must be fundamental to who you are, Pardis. Is there a special resilience or curiosity? And, and I already can tell you're not a person who's like, yeah, I'm the best at such and such. Mm -hmm. But is there a kind of curiosity or a resilience in you that you think is part of the drive that's, that's gotten you through the work you've done? 
Oh yeah, I mean, I I can say that even, but yeah, I I don't know. I mean, like my life story, but like I'm the Terminator. I should I should be dead many times over. I mean, I, yeah, you got it. I mean, I, so many crazy things have happened to me in my life where, uh, um, yeah, I almost died several times. Like I, I think it's one of those things where you're like you know what, like, uh, yeah, I, I'm every day is like a, a, a very much like an afterlife, and so for me, it's like I'm just gonna keep being curious until until I'm uh, finally get like you know wiped out <laughs> and in the, in the meantime I'm just going to keep going so I think certainly um from that perspective I uh, I think it, one of the attributes I I feel is like I've got to have is resilience because um I mean as one example I uh was a passenger in a vehicle accident where I shattered my pelvis in both my knees and had like zero, you know, it was a 10 out of 10 accident. I wasn't supposed to be alive um, and I'm half metal now. Uh, so it's, but you know, and that, I mean, the, the first few days I definitely was like, just kill me, like somebody kill me. Like I definitely didn't want to be alive. Um, but then I was just like, I want to figure everything out I can about this. And I got really into it and I became like this like super expert on nutrition and, you know, a lot of Eastern medicine and all the different practices and just, spoke to every single person that ever had an accident like mine and you know like that's just a, it was one of these things I'm going to science the crap out of this I'm going to figure out exactly what has to happen and and get some data points on this and and uh and frankly like realize how bad we are at that we're really bad we're really good at catastrophic events and then really bad at thriving so I was supposed to be a handicap and people were the disabilities committees were talking to me and that was like going to be my life and people are going to be happy if I could bend my knees and that was it, you know, um, and I was like, that's not in the cards for me. So for me, um, every insanity is an opportunity to learn. And, and certainly you got to like failure, not your sorry, You got to be, you shouldn't like failure. You should be comfortable with failure and, and, and challenge if you want to survive in this field or in any, like to just live on this earth today. I mean, you got to, we're all embracing so much challenge. Um, but certainly I'm, I'm a person who, uh, embraces a lot of challenges and has been through but particularly I think one of my students once said it of like it's no fun talking to parties because every whatever story whatever type of story you have she's like something that's like oh yeah it was kind of like when this happened to me and people were like never mind uh so um certainly that's probably one of the things that's most defining about me that I could I can agree with is that whatever the insanity is I'm always like let's just figure it out so Aoife, I'm going to spare you the top of that uh, a question there. But I was but going I mean, to say she's like Doctor Strange, Pardis. You're yeah. Doctor. You're the real life Doctor Strange here. I'm like thinking so in my head. Yes. So I'm, so sorry, I'm not going to share any of my medical history with you, Pardis. <laughs> I'm going to stay with Pardis on that for just a second for a novelty moment because Pardis, I noticed you you referred to yourself a little bit like the Terminator. You said you're half metal now. You are in a band. Uh, you actually recorded a song called Flesh and Bone. Um, mm -hmm. We have a little bit of that here that I want to, I want to play. Okay. So I don't know if we have it queued up. I think we thought we were going to right close to the end, but I can't resist. I want to do it now. Do we have that to, to play? So when I see that, Pardis, and then Aoife, we'll, we'll wrap with you. When I see that, there's, there's a, I'm so glad we showed the video because you are reaching out. Mm. Um, and you're talking about flesh and bone, but you're reaching out. And it looks like with every fiber of who you are. Mm. And in this work, is that what you do? Are you reaching out to the challenges? Um, you, you talk a lot about collaboration, cross-country collaboration in your work. Is that what you do? Are you reaching out with every fiber of who you are to solve these problems? Yeah, um, I think so. I, I, uh, I think I wish it was a little bit more like that. I think I'm reaching out with some sort of a, um, yeah, you know, I, that's a great question. I feel like I should think about that more and feel like I am doing that more. I'm not sure if that's what I'm doing, um, but I would strive to do it that way. So Aoife, I'll turn to you now. The, the, the first time you and I met, we were having a conversation about immigration, in fact, um, and you were very passionate about the, the immigrant experience here in the U.S. and where we are in policy, et cetera. So I think the thing I want to ask you now is 
bridge the work you're doing, which you're focused on, you're curious about, you're resilient with, to the rest of the change that you want to see in the world? And, and how do you think about those connections? Or are they, siloed is not always a good term, are they, are they different parts of your life? You know, I think everything is so interconnected because when I think about the Massachusetts innovation ecosystem and how much, you know, just talking about some of the, you know, future threats, no one knows what the future is going to hold in terms of challenges. You know, there's, you know, all kinds of things coming down the pike at us that we just haven't invested for that we don't know. But one thing that can help us survive is science and diversity and resilience and all those kinds of things. And I think that's where it's all interconnected for me, you know, being open to different cultures, being open to opportunities. I mean, that's where true innovation happens and comes is this exchange of ideas. And I just think we're going to need all of that, right? We're going to need all those brains and the best and brightest and put them in the right ecosystem where they can collide with each other and come up with really innovative solutions to some of the challenges that we don't even know are going to hit us, you know, down the road. So I think that's for me that kind of innovation piece is where the immigration, the diversity, the opportunity, the equality, all of that comes together in, you know, how do we foster and create a really inclusive innovation ecosystem? Because I just feel, you know, I, a mom of three kids, you know, I don't know what's, what challenges they're going to face in their lives, but I think it's going to be solved by science and it's going to be solved by innovation. And, you know, that's, that's a piece that to me brings all of those threads together. So it's less compartmentalized and more just, you know, hub and spoke um, type of framework that, that centers on this kind of science-based innovation. So let's stay there as we wrap and I'll ask you a listener question. What's next, do you think, Aoife, that will change our world? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So I work in synthetic biology and I, you know, if, if I was to spend a lot of time thinking about my concerns like soil failure, food insecurity, mass, mass immigration, something that we haven't seen to date, all driven by climate change, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. But the thing that gives me hope is, you know, there's amazing technologies. I think biology is amazingly powerful. I think we have the tools, we have the innovation, we have the ability, it's just we need the will, right? We need the will to invest, we need the will to go there to actually wake up and smell the coffee and, you know, it, 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 um, see what's coming for us and start investing now in the technologies that are really going to help us feed, you know, a planet of, you know, 10 billion inhabitants with challenge of climate change and all of the upheaval that's that's going to occur so I think you know I, I love Symbio because I think it has a huge potential to to really help us address some of those issues but um you know and I, I try to focus on the positive because otherwise it's uh, it's very difficult to function I think if you get too much in the hole but uh, some of the the scary stuff that could be coming down the pike how about you Pardis what's next that's going to change the world um I mean, I think that the, it's too many things. I mean, it's, the world is, I, I, I don't, um, there's a line that, um, yeah, there's a line I really like from Carl Sagan's um, book, Contact, uh, where um, there's an alien race that has kind of made it to earth and is created a, like a, a, a transporter that can take one person to meet them. And the main character, Ellie, is being asked by uh, Congress to interview for the position and is asked, you know, if you could ask one question, um, only one question, what would it be? Um, and she said, how did you do it? How did you survive your technological adolescence without destroying yourself? And I just thought that was such a powerful, that's like one of those lines from popular culture that's always stayed with me. Cause I think we're, we're certainly in our technological adolescence and the same tools that can transform the future can also destroy it. And um, it's not really clear where it's gonna go. Uh, and, um, so, I mean, obviously I'm very, very excited about the power of biology and what it can do, but I'm also terrified of it, um, and what, you know, what it can do in the wrong hands. So to me, like a lot of the, the, what is needed is, is a very, is really strong leadership, powerful leadership that's going to bring us to, um, work together, I think in the future. So, so much of like, when I talk about outbreak response as an example of that, I just sort of say like the technology is there we're not there, we're not ready for it, we're not equipped, we're not working together. Um, and in a situation like that, the virus is certainly gonna thrive. So I think from us, it's like, it's working alongside the technology, but realizing how to like, like each other as human beings to get to the point where we do something really powerful and um, 
you know, uh, transformative in the right way. Well, I think our audience probably will take comfort that at least in our ad technological adolescence, some of that technology is in the two of yours good hands. I really appreciate your time. I'm, I'm going to wrap us here. Thank you, Aoife Pardis, for a fascinating hour. I learned a lot. I enjoyed a lot uh, hearing from you. And I'll say to our audience, please join us for the next in our Phenomenal Women series on Wednesday, June 1st. If you join us then, I will be in conversation with tap dancer extraordinaire, choreographer, and MacArthur Fellow, Michelle Dorrance. But once again, Pardis, uh, Sabetti, Aoife Brennan, it's been a pleasure. You are phenomenal women. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, Christiana.